Acknowledging that you are ready to retire is the first of many confusing stages you'll have to face before you make the leap into retirement. This was the case for a 60 and 54 year old couple that I recently had the opportunity to help out. In today's video, I'm not only going to show you how I helped them create a five year retirement plan, but also how you can create your own too. As the owner of an independent financial planning firm, my company and I help clients all over the United States create safe, stress-free retirement plans. I have found that the most common problem for people attempting to retire is that the desire to retire is there, but many people delay the decision because they are afraid of being unprepared. Well, today we're gonna solve this problem by walking through this case study. Now, everything in the case study is accurate, except I've scrubbed the names and any personally identifying information. And so we're gonna get right into the video. Steve and Jane believe that they're about five to seven years from retiring. Steve is a commercial pilot and Jane is a full-time mom who has some side hustle income. They've been proactive about their retirement plans and diligent savers over the years. They have three kids, all of whom will begin college in the next 18 months. Overall, they feel proud of their financial accomplishments so far, but they tell me that for some reason they can't describe, they still feel uneasy. The issue is that Steve and Jane don't actually know when they can or should responsibly retire. They explain to me that they know that they don't know what they don't know. They don't know if they are saving the right amount or into the right account types. They hear that they should be doing tax planning or doing Roth conversions or contributions, but they don't know whether that's actually appropriate for their situation. Overall, they have felt comfortable doing what they've been doing and are nervous to change things. But they tell me that they really want to make use of the end of their accumulation runway and ensure that they're in a strong financial position once the kids are through college and out of the house. So Steve and Jane both agreed that they were too busy to become professional financial planners on their own, and so they reached out to us at Peak Financial Planning to build them a plan and help them execute. Right off the bat, Steve and Jane knew that they wanted more than just an investment strategy. They wanted someone who could help them visualize their financial picture and create a step-by-step action plan that addressed their entire financial life. To help set expectations and provide clarity about the experience we were gonna to share together, I explained that we were gonna lead them through a five-step process. Step one would be to perform a financial assessment. Step two would be to construct, review, and then select between multiple retirement plan options. And then step three would be to implement the chosen plan. And step four would be to establish a system to monitor the plan. And then step five would be to review contingency plans and adjust and update the plan with a regular frequency. After explaining the process, Steve and Jane were invited to our financial planning tool, Right Capital, which I'm gonna show on the screen soon. Accompanied by screen share videos and Zoom calls with our team, they uploaded documents to a secure file vault and added basic financial information into Right Capital so that we could perform their assessment. Over the course of the rest of this video, I'm gonna walk you through the results of their assessment and how we use that to tackle the remaining steps of our financial planning process. So we're gonna jump right into Right Capital and take a look at the data that they entered in there. We're gonna start here by going through their income, savings, and expenses. Jane and Steve Doe are currently 60 and 54 years old, as you can see here on the screen. Now they have three high school age kids with the oldest beginning college this year and the younger pair heading off to college next year. Steve works full time as a commercial pilot, earning a salary of $175,000 per year. He also has a military pension that pays about $45,000 per year. Jane has a small business and earns about $20,000 per year of self-employment income. Both of them are eligible for social security and you'll see those social security cards here on the screen, but we're gonna get into their social security benefit amounts later in this case study. For now, we're gonna tab over to their net worth page here and we're gonna review their retirement assets. Steve and Jane have just about $800,000 in total retirement savings. That's split between a wide range of accounts that you can see here on the screen. Most of their funds are in pre-tax accounts. Actually 700,000 of the 800,000 to be exact are in pre-tax accounts, meaning 401ks, IRAs, TSP, et cetera. They have a Roth account that has about $45,000 combined between two Roth accounts, and they have about $30,000 in a joint taxable account as well as some cash. They also have around $100,000 that you can see here saved, split between three 529s that are earmarked for their kids. And then finally, they own a home that's worth about 645K, and they have an outstanding balance of their mortgage here of about 243,000, which they expect to pay off in 2036 within the next 12 years. Finally, they have a small solar loan that you can see down here, and they're making $120 a month payments on that solar loan. Steve and Jane tell us that they want to know if they can retire at Steve's age 65. So Jane says she will likely keep up her side hustle income until her age 65, 
six years after Steve turns 65, but would like to know if that can be optional. Steve and Jane also tell us that they plan to support their kids' education using a combination of the funds in those three 529s and the GI Bill that Steve's military service will provide. Any education costs above those two sources are gonna be up to the kids. And now we can move on to the results of their assessment. So with the basic details out of the way, we're gonna tab over to the retirement tab right here and begin with our assessment of Steve and Jane's situation. Right off the bat, you can see here that this current plan on the right side, this dial that says 40%, assigns them a Monte Carlo score or a probability of success of 40%. Monte Carlo simply says, how likely is this couple to live the rest of their life and not run out of money? 100% would indicate that they would not run out of money in 100% of the tested scenarios. In this case, 40% means they're going to run out of money in 60% of scenarios. I've said this many times in my videos, but Monte Carlo scores are really not all that useful and I'm gonna illustrate why right here. See, yes, this screen tells us that the does have a 40% probability of success, but this Monte Carlo read, this probability of success read tells us absolutely nothing about why, nor does it tell us anything about what we can do about it. So for that, our team does a little digging and here's what we turn up. First, with the does current savings rate, they are unlikely to arrive at age 65 with a sufficient size pool of assets, unless they have absolutely stellar, outstanding market performance, which really is not a reliable planning option. The second thing we turn up is that the does are not actually saving as much as they believe they are. After we perform a bookkeeping exercise in the financial planning tool here, and we track the past 90 days of their spending, we find out that they're actually spending about $1,800 per month more than they say they are, which is about $21,600 per year. So they're currently saving about $30,000 into pre-tax accounts. And I'll pull that up here. We're gonna go into their cash flows and summary table here. And what you can see right here is that under planned savings, they're saving about $30,000 per year into Steve's pre-tax accounts. But they thought they were saving an additional 30,000 into the post-tax accounts, which is right here under net flows. But in actuality, they're saving much closer to $8,000 per year into those after-tax accounts compared to the 30,000 that they think they are. The third thing our assessment turns up is that their current plan relies too heavily on portfolio performance in order to make up for that savings gap, which introduces additional investment-related risk in the early years of their retirement. So after performing the assessment, our team goes back to the lab and comes up with three variations of retirement plans. In all three of the scenarios, Steve and Jane would have certain recommendations in common. So I'm gonna go through those recommendations first before I show the scenarios on the screen. The first recommendation is that they would use what's called a guardrails distribution approach. The second recommendation is that they would claim social security at Steve's age 70, and then Jane would claim at age 67 on Steve's record. And the third recommendation will be to make a particular set of asset allocation and investment changes in combination with a portfolio management style change. Now I'm gonna go over all three of those recommendations in a bit more detail, but with those three recommendations, now let's go through the three plan scenarios we presented to the does. Scenario one, which we believe to be the optimal plan is now on the screen here. In this scenario, Steve retires at 65, but the family is required to make some pre and post retirement spending adjustments. Specifically, they would need to cut spending by $600 per month or $7,000 per year year pre-retirement and allocate those dollars towards savings. So essentially taking their savings from $8,000 to $15,000 in the savings buckets that are outside of their pre-tax accounts. In addition to that, they would also need to commit to reducing post-retirement spending by $600 a month or $7,200 per year. These spending adjustments would allow Steve and Jane to retire at Steve's age 60 high, 65 with a high probability of success, 84%, as you can see here on the screen, and they'd get some additional benefits, which we're gonna review later in this video. Now, scenario two is one where Steve works one additional year until age 66, but they don't make those spending adjustments. Scenario three, Steve works two additional years until age 67, but again, they don't make those spending adjustments. And right off the bat, Steve and Jane tell us that they believe that they can make those spending adjustments recommended in scenario one. So we're not really gonna go into any further detail about scenarios two and three in this video. Steve and Jane do add that they would really like to understand the logic behind the five recommendations that are built into scenario one, which is the optimal plan on the left side of the screen. This optimal plan takes them from a 40% probability of success to an 84% probability of success. But as I said, the problem with Monte Carlo, it doesn't really clarify what's the impact coming from and what are they actually required to do. We begin by explaining that the logic behind our recommendations are mostly a result of the unique impact of Steve's military pension on their situation. So the combination of Steve's military pension along with 
claiming Social Security at Steve's age 70 and Jane's age 67 will allow them to have nearly 90% of their desired retirement spending covered in the majority of years after 2036. So that's 12 years from now. And that's because in 2036, they're going to have paid off their home and they're going to see a significant drop in their baseline expenses. So therefore, if we can provide a plan that helps them bridge their eight key retirement years from 2029 through 2036, then the does are likely to have a very comfortable retirement with significant spending flexibility flexibility beyond that point. It's just about getting to 2037 intact. We continue that because at this point in their lives, at Steve's age 60 and Jane's age 54, they will live the vast majority of the remainder of their lives in retirement. Therefore, it's the spending adjustment made in retirement that's going to have the largest impact on their plan. And we're going to help illustrate this by showing them a summary model that we use with all our clients, which we call RPI bands. So I'm gonna tab over to that, and there's a ton going on on the screen. All I really recommend focusing on initially is the color coding. Essentially what this summary table shows is a series of color-coded time periods marked by significant events in Steve and Jane's lives. The brown section at the top here, from 2024 to 2028, Steve and Jane are still working and therefore they're taking no withdrawals from their savings. They're in fact still contributing to savings. The yellow section below that from 2029 to 2034 are the first six years of their retirement where they're going to have only the military pension as a source of reliable income and will need to tap most significantly into their portfolio assets. And then the green line below that indicates the year in which Steve will claim Social Security and add an additional source of guaranteed income to the family's household income. The purple line below that indicates the year in which their home will be paid off, marking a significant decrease in household expenses. And then the blue period below that from 2037 onwards indicates the remainder of their retirement. That's when Jane claims Social Security and adds that to the mix. And from this point onward, they rely on portfolio assets for only between 10 and 15% of their desired annual spending for the majority of the rest of their retirement. And that's all Jane and Steve really need to take from this specific summary sheet. There's a lot of numbers on there and our team uses this sheet to pull additional data points, which I'm gonna show in smaller chunks throughout the rest of the Doe's plan. Now we continue explaining to the Doe's that this first set of recommendations around social security and spending adjustments are followed closely in impact by using a proactive dynamic retirement income or distribution approach. In this case, a guardrails approach. Now I'm going to tab over to a new screen here. And on this screen right here, I'm going to illustrate the basics of the Doe's guardrail approach, which we documented for them, just like what you see on the screen here. In this case, we project that they're going to arrive at retirement with roughly $1.3 million in retirement assets. You can see that here under starting portfolio value. The guardrail tool that we use incorporates all the data points we've described so far and provides the following guardrails and spending recommendations. So based on a starting portfolio value of a million three hundred thousand, they would be able to draw about a hundred thousand dollars, which you can see right here in this bucket, ninety nine nine seventy, in their first full year of retirement, which is a distribution rate of roughly seven point seven percent. Now. In the guardrail scenario, if the portfolio sees a 25% reduction in size, then it hits the lower guardrail and they would take a 5% reduction in income in the ensuing year. If the portfolio sees a 16% increase in size, which is on the left upper guardrail here, they would take a 16% increase in income in the ensuing year. For as long as the portfolio re balance remains between the two guardrails, between that $1.5 million at the upper side and the $975,000 on the lower side, they would take that $100,000 per year and adjust it for inflation each year ensuing. Now, this is all driven by a formula behind the scenes that will adjust in real time if, for instance, they arrive at retirement with a different size pool of assets. Unfortunately, I don't have time today to talk at length about guardrails specifically, but I've received a ton of interest in this retirement withdrawal strategy. I plan to release a video dedicated to guardrail withdrawal strategies in the coming weeks, so make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to catch that video. Now, we continue by explaining to Steve and Jane that their plan is what we call front-loaded with risk. Their financial risks are primarily in the first seven years of their retirement. Once they pass through to 2037, they will likely be in the clear as a result of their very high household guaranteed income. And this is illustrated on this next page using what I call a summary table called a distribution rate comparison table. This table shows their distribution rate in the first six years of their retirement from 2029 to 2034. It compares their current plan to the optimal plan that we have constructed for them. Their current plan would require distribution rates in excess of 6% 
for five consecutive years. And you can see that right here. With the recommendations we give them, the model shows that we can reduce their distribution rate by roughly 1.2% per year over those six years. In this case, they would have only two years with distribution rates above 6%, right here you can see, compared to originally having five. And they'd also have zero years with distribution rates above 7% compared to their baseline or current plan having three years above 7% distribution rates. The next thing we can illustrate is the impact of these changes on their projected portfolio balance by the end of their risky retirement years. And you can see that in this next summary table. With no adjustments put in place, they arrive in 2034 at the end of that first six years of retirement with a projected balance of 1.4 million in retirement savings. With the adjustments made, they arrive in 2034 with $1.52 million in retirement savings, a difference of $126,000. Finally, we take them to the third and most important of the summary tables of this batch. We call this the stress testing table. Remember earlier I said that their plan was heavily reliant on market performance, in fact, too much so? Well, the Doe's primary plan weakness is in fact investment underperformance, specifically poor sequence of returns pre-retirement and in the first five years of retirement. The spending reduction recommendation that we give the Doe's is specifically designed to target that weakness. In fact, as you'll see in a couple of minutes, when we get to the investment recommendations, the spending reduction of $600 per month has a far greater impact on the Doe's successfully navigating poor markets than any asset allocation or investment change we could suggest. When the does follow all recommendations, but they don't follow the recommendation to cut that $600 of spending, they have a probability of success of roughly 69%. And that's what you can see here. We wanted to illustrate to them, what if you don't do the spending reduction? What if you do everything else we recommend, but not the spending reduction? So they end up with the baseline of 69% probability of success. And when they follow the spending reductions that we recommend, that probability goes up to 84%. But what happens if there is a 20% market correction before they retire? And that's what you can see here. In that scenario, the no spending reduction scenario sees their probability of success drop to 60%. The optimal plan, which we're recommending, sees their probability of success drop from 84 to 77.7%, .7 a much smaller drop. Now, what about a scenario where there is no market correction before they retire? But what if it happens right when they retire? In that first scenario, their baseline where they don't trim spending, the probability of success drops further to 57.4%, while in the optimal plan, it only drops to 75.4%. And any plan probability above 70% is one that we're, we're comfortable recommending a client can retire in that scenario. So this really illustrates how influential reducing spending is to the Doe's overall success in retirement. Now we've covered a lot of ground here, but we still have two really important areas to cover with Steve and Jane. The first is, what about Roth conversions? And the second is, what investment recommendations are we gonna give the does? We explained to Steve and Jane that in their specific case, we really don't recommend Roth conversions. I'm gonna bring up the following two summary tables to explain this logic. Their optimal Roth conversion scenario would be to convert enough assets to fill the 24% tax bracket between the years of 2029 and 2032, the first four years of their retirement. The model shows us that when they do this, they don't actually break even until Steve's age 84 and Jane's age 79. And this being the case, Steve is very unlikely to get any economic benefit himself out of Roth conversions. Now, Jane might, because she will be younger and live longer, but there is actually a significant risk that is not clear on the surface that we have to disclose to Steve and Jane. The risk is that the cost of the Roth conversions in early retirement sends their distribution rates sky high, introducing even more risk to the first eight years of their retirement should their investments underperform. And you can see what I just described here in this second summary table below. The extra 277,000 of taxes that they would have to pay in the first four years of retirement for their Roth conversions brings their distribution rates up by between 5.5% and 11% in the first four years of retirement. You can see that right here where it says difference. Not only that, but if Steve should pass away early, Jane will actually see a significant reduction in her guaranteed income. Steve's military pension would be cut in half and Jane would see a reduction in household social security benefits as well. So the combination of all those factors are a big red flag to us, resulting in the recommendation not to perform Roth conversions. We tell Steve and Jane that this could change in the future if markets outperform or if they inherit money or come into some additional retirement resources. Finally, 
we're gonna take Steve and Jane to their investment recommendations. Steve and Jane arrived working with us with a 65% stock and 35% bond portfolio composed exclusively of Vanguard mutual funds. In real life, the investment recommendations receive one or two dedicated 90 minute meetings to review. Unfortunately, in this video, I don't have time to go into that level of detail. I did, however, release a video recently called the retirement investing lies all retirees believe. And if you'd like to understand more of the logic behind the three investment recommendations I'm going to share with the does, then you, I highly recommend going and watching that other video, which I'll link to at the end of this video. So I'll put one of those YouTube cards at the end of this video. So we recommend three separate changes to Steve and Jane. The first is to use what is called a reverse glide path. A reverse glide path is when one reduces their investment risk exposures for a period of time leading up to retirement as well as in early retirement, and then gradually increases their risk exposure in retirement once they've passed the riskiest part of their retirement. In the Doe's case, this means shifting to a roughly 55% stock, 45% bond portfolio right away, and then holding there for 10 years until 2034, after which they would increase their stock portfolio or stock allocation by 2.5% every second year. This type of asset allocation strategy will provide some defense against sequence of returns risk or market risk, which is their primary risk factor. The second recommendation is to use a more diversified portfolio that holds individual stocks and bonds in addition to exchange traded funds. And the third recommendation is to use a more active style of investment management called absolute tolerance bands. It's a rebalancing strategy that tells them more proactively how and when to rebalance their investments. The effects of these three recommendations are actually summarized on this third spreadsheet here with between these two summary tables that you can now see on the screen. This first summary table up here is a repeat of the stress testing summary table I showed earlier. In this one on the screen here, we tested two scenarios. Scenario one is where we use the optimal plan. We include the Doe's original asset allocation, not the one we're recommending. And the second scenario where it says new AA is where we use the optimal plan, but include the new asset allocation and glide path. And you can see here that there is modest improvements. It's really nothing to write home about, but also still worth doing. In the baseline right here, there is no market correction. The difference in probability of success from this asset allocation change is a very modest 1.3%. When there is a market correction pre-retirement, we see a probability of success of an improvement of 2.7%. And then when there's a market correction at retirement, but not pre-retirement, we see that same probability of success improvement of 2.7%. To finalize the investment recommendations, we're also gonna show Steve and Jane some back testing we did to compare the performance and risk measures of their current portfolio against our suggested portfolio. You can see those results in this second summary table down here called back testing. We tested both portfolios from January, 2013 through the present. Their old portfolio had an annualized return here of 11.1% over that period. Really not bad at all. Standard deviation or variance, which is the second measure we're going to test right here, is a risk measure that indicates how much volatility a portfolio may face. The higher the standard deviation, the bigger the swings in the portfolio value, both to the upside and the downside. The Doe's current asset allocation had a standard deviation of 12.2%. And then the third measure that we test was called maximum drawdown right here which tells us what was the biggest decrease in portfolio value that this specific portfolio saw over the testing period. In the Doe's case, that was 23.3%. Now our goal in suggesting an alternative portfolio was to see if we could provide a comparable asset allocation that could produce similar rates of return, but with reduced risk. And on the right, you can see that this looks pretty likely. The suggested portfolio would have had a comparable or maybe marginally higher annualized rate of return of roughly 11.7%. It would have also achieved that with roughly 18% reduction in risk on the standard deviation variance side and an 11% reduction in maximum drawdown, which you can see here. Not only that, but the suggested portfolio that we back tested here is actually a 55% stock, 45% bond portfolio compared to the Doe's starting portfolio, which is a 65 stock, 35 bond portfolio. So at this point, the Doe's are both exhausted, sick of spreadsheets, financial planning tools, and charts. However, Steve and Jane actually report to us that they found it extremely helpful to have all their models and possible action items documented into simple, easy to use 
financial dashboards. They felt like they understood the order of operations here, starting with reviewing their baseline probability of success, then understanding the impact of making pre- and post-retirement spending reductions, then having an understanding of where they were most vulnerable in the periods of their retirement, using that understanding to influence the social security claiming recommendation and the Roth conversion recommendation, and then from there understanding how the use of guardrails would clarify and guide them in distributing income once they're retired, and what types of portfolio changes might be helpful to reduce risk and improve their financial outcomes. They felt that their financial life was much more organized, having consolidated all their notes and goals into one place. They can see the road ahead of them more clearly and evaluate the options in front of them more accurately. Most importantly, they now know exactly what options they have to improve their spendable wealth and probability of success in retirement. All they have to do from here is choose what to implement, and then execute. And this brings this week's video to a close. So I hope you found this exploration helpful. If you'd like to learn more about how we help our clients build comprehensive retirement income and investing plans, just like the one for the does here, you can visit our website at www.thepeakfp.com. As always, thank you for your time and attention, and I'll see you in the next video. And if you'd like to see that retirement investing lies video that I mentioned earlier in this video, you can click the card right here. Thanks so much.